next item of business is a debate on motion 9241 in the name of Johan Lamont on petition PE1517 on polypropylene mesh medical devices. May I ask those who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons and I call on Johan Lamont to speak to and move the motion on behalf of the Public Petitions Committee. Up to 13 minutes please Ms Lamont. Thank you very much Deputy Presiding Officer. I am pleased and privileged to open this debate on behalf of the Public Petitions Committee and to play a small part in the opportunity to bring this critical issue to further public attention. Petition 1517 on polypropylene mesh medical devices was lodged in April 2014, receiving over 1,700 signatures of support and attracting 212 comments. The committee will be considering a draft report on the petition in due course and will reflect in this afternoon's debate in consideration of that report. And what is said today will, of course, help shape that report, a report that I believe a very important one. And before I move to the key themes and concerns raised by the petition, I would like to place on record my thanks on behalf of the committee to the petitioners Elaine Holmes and Olive McElroy, all the other women and their husbands, partners, friends and family who have provided their own testimony of the impact that MESH has had on their lives. A testimony given often at huge personal cost. And while we have, by their courage, been given a window into what they have suffered, we are not living with it every day as they do, with the impact on, their, on, on every aspect of their lives. The testimony is set out in the 80 plus written submissions we have received on the petition to date. It would also be remiss of me not to acknowledge the MSPs who do not sit in the committee, but who have joined us in our consideration of the petition. I expect that Jackson Carlaw, Neil Finlay, Alec Neil, and John Scott will be contributing to today's debate, just as they have contributed to the committee's deliberations. The session four committee's consideration of the petition started in June 2014 with evidence from the petitioners. It's an indication of the impact of this evidence that just two weeks later, the then Cabinet Secretary for Health and Wellbeing, Alec Neill, gave evidence to the committee. It was in the course of this evidence session that both the intention to establish an independent review and the request for a moratorium on the use of mesh devices were announced. And it is worth taking a few moments to say something about that moratorium, as it transpired that mesh operations did continue while this was in place. We heard during our most recent evidence session from Dr. Whelagar that the Cabinet Secretary's request was disseminated to health boards by the Chief Medical Officer. The request asked the boards to consider suspending the use of mesh in procedures for pelvic organ prolapse or stress urinary incontinence. However, it became clear that boards retain autonomy over their operations and as such were under no binding obligation to act upon the request or to confirm whether or not it was intended that MESH procedures would continue in their area. Now, while I cannot speak for the members of the Session 4 Committee, I do not think that this would have been their understanding of what a moratorium entailed. This is something that should be reflected upon for any future circumstances in which a moratorium may be requested. And I would welcome the Cabinet Secretary's commitment to ensure that that is done. With that said, I think members will understand that I would wish to focus most of my opening remarks on the process and outcomes of the independent review. Membership of the independent review comprised representatives of the urologists, researchers, professional bodies, patient representatives, public health professionals, the regulatory body for medical devices and the office of the chief medical officer. Secretariat support to the chair was provided by the Scottish Government. The Independent Review's published remit was, quote, to evaluate both the efficacy and the extent and causes of adverse incidents and complication rates associated with stress, urinary incontinence and for pelvic organ prolapse. Its formal title was, quote, Scottish Independent Review of the Use, Safety and Efficacy of Transvaginal Mesh Implants in the Treatment of Stress, Urinary Incontinence and Pelvic Organ Prolapse in Women. At our most recent meeting, the petitioners informed the committee that they had, quote, to fight to get the word safety put in the heading of the review. And that certainly uh, gave me pause for thoughts, I'm sure other committee members too. The independent review got to work with a milestone reach when it published an interim report in October 2015. The independent review's interim report was tentatively welcomed insofar as it represented signs of progress and enabled interested parties, not least the government and MESH survivors, to reflect on the interim conclusions. 
It should be noted, however, that the petitioners produced a minority report and the Scottish Mess Survivors Group considered that the recommendations should be actioned immediately and outcomes monitored before any further mesh procedures took place. The interim report produced eight conclusions. These related to the need for robust clinical governance, multidisciplinary team working with appropriate levels of audit activity to ensure the recording and reporting of adverse events, the need for fully informed consent to ensure that women had the opportunity to discuss with a clinician all the options that are available to them and the pros and cons of each. Serious concern that some women who had reported adverse events were not believed. Concerns about the efficacy of short-term studies into the safety and effectiveness of MESS procedures, given that many adverse effects do not become evident until five, ten or more years after a MESH procedure. The lack of reliable or robust information systems to record the number of procedures carried out and, by extension, difficulties in accurately measuring adverse events. Concerns around the use of transoperator mesh procedures rather than retropubic mesh tape procedure for what was referred to as, quote, routine surgery for stress urinary incontinence. These concerns were based on information produced in Chapter 6 of the interim report, accompanied by a number of tables and similar concerns with use of mesh in surgery for pelvic organ prolapse. The October 2015 report was explained as being interim because the independent review was awaiting the outcomes and findings from two pieces of work. The first of these was the final opinion of the European Commission Scientific Committee on Emerging and Newly Identified Health Risks on the Safety of Surgical Meshes Used in Eurojet Gynecological Surgery. That opinion was published in December 2015. Its recommendations included the implementation, the implantation of any mesh for the treatment of pelvic organ prolapse via the vaginal route should only be considered in complex cases, in particular after failed primary repair surgery. For all procedures, the amount of mesh should be limited where possible. The second was the prolapse surgery, pragmatic evaluation and randomized controlled trials referred to as a prospect study. One of the primary outcomes assessed in this three-year study was the quality of life for women who had reported prolapse symptoms. The final report from the study was published in The Lancet in December 2016. It concluded that augmentation of a vaginal repair with mesh or graft material did not improve women's outcomes in terms of effectiveness, quality of life, adverse effects, or any other outcome in the short term. In addition, it found that more than one in 10 women, approximately 12%, experienced a complication associated with MESH. The study concluded that follow-up was vital to identify whether there were any potential longer-term benefits for women, and conversely, to identify any potential serious adverse effects of MESH procedures for pelvic organ prolapse. With those two, these two pieces of work completed, the Independent Review's final report was published in March this year. I have to say it would be a significant understatement to say that the final report was not as well received as the interim report. There were resignations from the independent review shortly before publication of the final report amid reported concerns that it was not fully independent, was misleading and a backward step from the interim report. Indeed, the petitioners were reported by the BBC as feeling betrayed and concerned that the report was a whitewash. There were concerns expressed by the petitioners and members of this parliament that information had been either omitted altogether or moved to a different part of the report. Significant concerns related in particular to the removal of the shared decision tables in chapter six of the final report. These concerns have already been raised in this chamber, both at topical questions and during the cabinet secretary's statement to the parliament on 30th March. In May, the committee took evidence from the chair of the independent review and then from the cabinet secretary and the Chief Medical Officer. Unfortunately, the evidence we heard seemed to produce more questions than answers. We were unable to establish a clear understanding of how decisions were taken within the independent review, whether they were taken by subgroups, the full group, or at the discretion of the Chair. The Committee felt that this lack of clarity could have been avoided through the provision of readily accessible minutes or notes of correspondence. There was also some confusion around the timeline of communications between the petitioners, the Cabinet Secretary and the Chair of the Independent Review. This extended into the decisions that were made following receipt of the communications from the petitioners that they wanted all of their contributions removed from the, pro the report. 
That did not happen. The review's final report does recommend that the reporting of mesh adverse events should be mandatory. This is to be welcomed, although it appeared from the evidence that we heard that this was a conclusion that was reached quite late in the day. A number of the other recommendations are also welcome, insofar as they address symptoms and practices that should be in place as a matter of clinical governance. However, there are two specific recommendations that I would like to focus on. Conclusion 7 of the final report recommends that in relation to stress urinary incontinence, women must be afforded all appropriate treatments, that is mesh and non-mesh. It adds that women must have the information to make informed choices. I cannot stress how important it is that when considering their options, women have the opportunity to discuss these with their clinician and have their views listened to. These discussions must be based on the most up-to-date information available. Conclusion 8 on the surgical treatment of pelvic organ prolapse considered that a mesh procedure did not provide any additional benefit over natural tissue repair. However, that conclusion seemed to be somewhat qualified by stating that, quote, transvaginal mesh procedures must not be offered, and I emphasise this next word, routinely. In evidence to the committee, the Cabinet Secretary advised that the Scottish Government would establish an oversight group to take forward the recommendations. She added that, quote, the key safeguards that are to be put in place must be implemented, implemented before any procedures using mesh are reintroduced routinely. When I sought clarification from the Cabinet Secretary on whether the moratorium would remain in place until such time as the recommendations have been implemented, she replied that the suspension will not be lifted until medical directors have assured the Chief Medical Officer that all the recommendations in the final report have been implemented. Now, it could be argued that much of what the petition called for has been delivered. For example, a moratorium was requested, the initiation of the independent review, mandatory reporting of adverse events, and the progress has been made towards fully informed consent. However, the outcome of the independent review is such that it would be absolutely inappropriate for the petition to be closed at this point. This is reflecting the fact that the Cabinet Secretary has commissioned Professor Alison Britton to conduct a review of the independent review. And I've had the opportunity to meet with Professor Britton along with the Deputy Convener to understand her remit and to flag up to her some of the concerns and issues that have come to light in recent months as part of our considerations of this petition. The Cabinet Secretary has offered her reassurances that the recommendations of the Independent Review's final report should stand pending the conclusion of Professor Britton's review of the review. However, the overriding concern has come across during our consideration is people's lack of confidence in the independent review process and as a result in its outcomes. In the light of people's already fragile confidence in the governance and findings of the independent review, if Professor Britton's review finds the progress of the, the process of the independent review to have been significantly flawed, how can the Cabinet Secretary, this Parliament and most importantly the public be assured that the outcomes of the independent review are robust and credible? I hope that today's debate provides an opportunity for that and other questions to be answered. We may sadly have to confront the harsh truth that the damage done to the petitions and others cannot be repaired. But we must do what we can so that their experience is not repeated. Believing all these women and responding to their well-founded understanding of what must change would be a good start. I move the motion in my name. Uh, may I respectfully say to those in the gallery that it's not appropriate to either show appreciation or indeed otherwise uh, during the debate. Thank you. And I now call Shona Robson up to eight minutes, please, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, Deputy President Officer, for the opportunity to take part in this debate on what is a, a very important issue and for the chance to give the Chamber an update on the Scottish Government's work in this area. I'd also like to take the opportunity to thank the Public Petitions Committee for all its work and deliberations on the issue of transvaginal mesh and most importantly the, thank the women Elaine Holmes and Olive McElroy who brought this very important issue to light through their petition. Members might recall that I gave a statement uh, on uh, transvaginal mesh back in March. At that time, I spoke about what led my predecessor to establish the Scottish Independent Review of Mesh. It was the brave action of the Scottish Mesh survivors, patients who had suffered serious complications and who petitioned Parliament. In doing so, they spoke very openly about the difficulties they face on a daily basis. Indeed, it's those actions as well as the stories that I've heard from women who have written and spoken to me over the months and years 
and it led me to continue to treat this issue with the utmost importance. Given the complexity of the issue, it has proved difficult to reach a consensus. But however, what is important is how we move forward uh, and the improvements that we propose will keep our aim of continuous improvement uh, in NHS Scotland. Members will recall my commitment, just in a second, my, members will recall my commitment to look at concerns raised about the process of the independent review. And that is why I asked Professor Alison Britton of Glasgow Caledonian University to examine the course of the independent review and she will produce a report with recommendations about how future similar reviews could be conducted. Yeah. Neil Finlay. It's much more than the process, I have to say, uh, Cabinet Secretary. However, the point I wanted to make is that not, is there not an issue here where it takes uh, the women to have to go through that very long process of the petitions process to get to the stage we are today and that they feel quite rightly that no one was listening. Shona Robson. I, I think Neil Finlay actually makes an important point that uh, it shouldn't have taken a petition for this issue to get the, 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 the light to have been brought out into the light as it has done but certainly what has flowed from that uh, has been some very very important changes that I want to come on uh, to highlight because changes have been made and I think it's important to record that uh, and I want to come on and say uh, that because what is important is that we don't lose sight of the central issue here and that is that we ha have to continue our work to address the issues raised by so many women and to build on the work of everyone uh, who has taken part uh, in the independent review and the other processes that uh, Neil Finlay referred to. The review made eight clear rec uh, key recommendations and the Scottish Government has accepted all of those recommendations and expects all health boards to take note of future developments as I'll now explain. Officials have been working with the GMC in drafting updated guidance about shared decision making and this is imp the important point Joanne Lamont made. The drafting of this updated guidance is now complete and will be subject to wider consultation anticipated to start in the spring of next year. The emphasis of the guidance is on sharing information, explaining risk and giving choices. The importance of doctors working in partnership with patients and supporting them to make decisions is stressed and all clinicians are expected to abide by it. When I made the statement to uh, the Chamber back in March, I explained that an oversight group would be established. This group is absolutely key, and I can confirm that Healthcare Improvement Scotland has taken forward that work in the months since I made that announcement. It will regularly review data relating to MESH procedures and will scrutinise adverse event reporting. And what is particularly significant, however, is that the group will continuously review new studies and new evidence and will carefully consider how that new evidence can be incorporated into pathways of care. The group will also help to ensure patient information is relevant and up to date. Indeed, the production of a patient information and consent leaflet for pelvic organ prolapse and the review of the existing leaflet for stress urinary incontinence will be a key task for the group. And what is important here is that the oversight group has absolutely the right people on board with the level of expertise and experience necessary to take forward such critical work. That's why I'm pleased to be able to confirm that Professor Lorna McKee has been appointed chair of the oversight group. Professor McKee is now Emeritus Professor of Management and Health Services Research at the University of Aberdeen. And I wish Professor McKee well in her role and look forward to future updates on the progress being made in achieving implementation of the, the review group's recommendations. Uh, very briefly. Neil Finlay. You mentioned Aberdeen and I don't know the individual in involved, but is the government aware of any allegations of research misconduct on the SIMS study um, that, was, that took place in Aberdeen and has there been any communications with the government and those who were involved in that study? Well, Shona I mean, Robson. can I make very clear, Professor McKee um, is absolutely above reproach in this matter. I mean, we're, it's very, very important that she is allowed uh, to get on with the job of chairing the oversight uh, group and that, um, that, that, that there's no, I hope there's no inference from Neil Finlay that uh, she is in any way connected uh, with that. Those issues are, are completely separate and I think we should allow Professor McKee to get on with the important uh, work of the oversight group. Um, importantly as well is that Healthcare Improvement Scotland has well-established procedures for engaging with the general public through their public partners scheme. 
and his will ensure that the oversight group has full representation of patients who have direct experience in the best way that they feel uh, they wish to be involved. The group will meet for the first time in early December and that meeting will focus on future planning and the first full meeting of the group will take place in January. As my colleagues will be aware, there was an almost parallel... Um, I'm, I want to make some progress, if you don't mind. As my colleagues will be aware, there was an almost parallel process in NHS England involving a different group of patients, clinicians and evidence reviewers who published a report in July this year which came to very similar conclusions. I wish to note, however, that in Scotland the independent review went further and used the language of the regulator, the General Medical Council, stating that MESH procedures must not be offered routinely for POP, whereas the NHS England report noted that the use of vaginal mesh in primary procedures to treat POP is not supported by the current evidence and this should not be offered routinely for the first surgical intervention. Now importantly members will be aware that NICE will shortly publish their updated guidance on the use of mesh for pelvic organ repair as part of their interventional procedures programme guidance. As NHS Scotland is a full partner in this programme the guidance must and will be implemented. Such procedures will be included in patient management pathways and as I've mentioned the new evidence for these pathways will be overseen by the new oversight group. I await the revised guidance with interest however what we've already have in place in Scotland is a clear set of recommendations that place a clear emphasis on patient safety. I can also confirm that the Chief Medical Officer has today written to all NHS Board Medical Directors and the Oversight Group drawing their attention to the forthcoming NICE guidance. The CMO has also written to the MHRA who after all as we've discussed many times in this chamber are the only organisations that can ban MESH pointing to the, uh, the recent publication from the uh, Australian Therapeutic uh, Goods Administration because I think it is important that we, we hear back from the MHRA about their response to that publication. I'd also like to be clear, meanwhile, that the request to suspend remains in place and will do so until the Chief Medical Officer is satisfied that all the recommendations have been implementing implemented including all upcoming changes to guidance and necessary safeguards are in place. In essence what we expect is that the consent procedures and other safeguards will be put in place taking into account all new guidance into pathways meaning that the situation in future will not be greatly different to that under the current suspension. What we all want to see is a change in the whole approach to this condition. I hope I've been able to set out over the last few minutes uh, the up the updated position. Well, I will in the closing remarks, uh, Mr. Scott. I, I can allow you the time. Seconds. So I hope I've been able to give members reassurance that the Scottish Government takes this issue very seriously uh, and indeed we have made progress since the publication of the independent review report and I'll come back to members in the closing remarks with any other issues they want to raise. I call on Jackson Carlaw for seven minutes please. Uh, presiding officer, this full debate brought to the Chamber by the Public Petitions Committee is long overdue and especially welcome. It's now nearly some four years since my constituent Elaine Holmes visited my constituency office on crutches, anxious about the nature of what she had to discuss and share, but absolutely determined even then that she would do all she could to bring a spotlight to MESH procedures and to what has gradually but inexorably become a worldwide scandal and in Scotland a devastating tragedy for far too many women. And I don't say scandal lightly. Born in 1959, I remember my bewildered shock when as a child in the mid to late 1960s, I read Sunday Times newspaper features on thalidomide. This too was marketed as a convenience for women and a safe one at that. Facts were concealed, lives ruined, lives compromised to this day, women patronized by experts, living, practicing, operating, researching and preaching from their ivory towers. Mesh is the 21st century's thalidomide, a worldwide scandal every bit as devastating. Presiding officer at the heart of the Mesh scandal is the most deeply personal testimony. Who can ever expect to have to, without warning, find themselves suffering from chronic pain, a loss of sexual function, to have Mesh protrude through the bladder or bowel, sometimes being removed with horrendous consequences. Organs trapped and entwined with mesh, shrinking and moving inside the body, slicing through nerve endings, tissue and those same organs. I've met the women in wheelchairs and in crutches, and who among us cannot also appreciate the courage in these women stepping forward to discuss these intimate details, and in many cases, with male politicians. 
The Public Petitions Committee led. Alex Neal as Cabinet Secretary for Health and Wellbeing led. No one doubted the commitment to of Shona Robeson as the review committee established in 2014 went about its business. Presiding officer, that is why the sense of betrayal and dismay among all those MESH survivors is so profoundly felt. They thought, I thought, we all frankly thought that government was on their side. Again, the rest of the world took note. As litigation, which has now generated billions in compensation, commenced, here was political leadership in Scotland, where the unique circumstance of a smaller NH NHS made action possible and credible. We were ahead of the rest of the UK. Slow they were to pull all this together, given the many health boards in England and the lack of coordinated patient networks. Patients there also looked to Scotland. Now, throughout, I've listened to many experts. They've presented both to the Petitions Committee, so-called experts like the lamentable MHRA leadership, who denied in a risible and dismal performance here at Holyrood that there was even an issue or that many women were afflicted, even as those women sat packed in rows behind them. Or experts who have dared to suggest that women perhaps might seek psychiatric help. And yet, surely the most reasoned and impressive of all these experts was the consultant physician Dr. Whalagur, also a constituent, who along with Elaine and Olive McElroy resigned from the review committee in abject dismay and professional fury at the bowdlerization of the draft report of the review committee, the travesty of chapter six, into the shameful and widely despised whitewash of a report finally published. The new chair was deeply unimpressive witness. It was Dr. Agur who spoke without artifice and with sincere clarity as he talked through his own journey towards believing in a complete ban, he also exposed the fallacy of the informed consent process. Of the 22 women who made use of his health board's shared decision-making tool to assess whether MESH was appropriate for them, only one, yes, just one, decided in favor of the procedure, and that was because she hadn't read the leaflet properly, and when she did, changed her view. I understand and take note of what the Cabinet Secretary has said about the advice and guidance that is underway and is going to be subject to scrutiny, and I look forward to seeing the outcome of that. Presiding officer, there was talk ahead of today's debate of amendments to the motion to make a much more direct demand of government. Now, I understand these calls, but I'm not yet convinced the moment has arrived where this parliament must divide. However, I do want to be very clear with the cabinet secretary. This is last saloon chance territory. If decisive progress is not forthcoming, then we will, however reluctantly, seek to find common cause with others in this chamber to require a mandate, action and change. As the SNP MP Brendan O'Hara stated in the Westminster Hall debate in October, this devastation for women and their families is absolutely intolerable and must never be allowed to happen again. Presiding officer, there must be no interruption to the current suspension ban. There must be a full public consultation on the content of the review which took place to be published alongside the procedural view led by Professor Britton. There must be a sustained engagement with the Westminster government in respect of the actions and performance of the MHRA. Politicians of all sides will willingly join in this, here and at Westminster, where Owen Smith MP and my East Renfrewshire colleague Paul Masterton MP respectively chair and co-chair the all-party group in MESH. The Scottish Government must act on Alex Neil's proposal to convene an international summit here at Holyrood to allow Scotland to regain the public initi political initiative. There may be aspects of this scandal which are reserved and others devolved, but for pity's sake, we can no lo this can no longer be a defence against the most determined and joint close working and cooperation. Presiding officer, the hourglass has run. Huge legal compensation claims the world over are, la are landing with health services. More than 800 are now underway in the UK. This too is an issue of immense concern all in itself. But this issue, which will all be about money, about consent, about all the most basic issues of women's dignity and our quality of life and that of our family, and that too of the increasing number of men who have also had mesh implanted, demonstrating complications, is about more than that. Led by Elaine and Olive, these Scottish women are an inspiration. I'll confess to being a sentimental sort, but the coldest glass eye could not be in the company of women, compromised in so many ways, who have become a, a joint support network a hugely entertaining social party and one of Scotland's most effective campaigning groups and not be moved by their efforts. Presiding officer, I want Scotland to lead again. I want us to prevent MESH destroying more lives ahead. I want in all sincerity this parliament to be able to look to our government to regain that leadership. We have waited patiently as due process has promised hope only to thwart it instead. 
I look to the government for justice. And I'm sorry, Cabinet Secretary, I say to you now, please act and please act now. I call on Neil Finlay around seven minutes, please. Uh, thanks, President Officer, and can I thank the Petitions Committee very much for bringing this uh, forward. It's been a long time coming. Five years ago, um, on becoming my party's uh, Shadow Cabinet Secretary for Health, I was handed a portfolio of issues from my colleague Jackie Bailey. And it was a few news cuttings about an issue that no one was really talking about, transvaginal mesh. And along with uh, Tommy Kane, my researcher, I soon met with the then small group of women affected by this product. We immediately struck up a friendship that is sustained to this day, and they're some of the finest people I have ever met. I'm proud to call them my pals. Um, all have been affected by this polypropylene product, permanently inserted into their body in an attempt to address incontinence or prolapse. And when implanted, body tissue grows through its pores. It cannot be removed without serious nerve and tissue damage, and removal has been compared to removing chewing gum from a person's hair. <coughs> In many patients, the mesh lost its pliability. It became rigid, it started to break up, dispersing shards and fragments throughout the body. Now, the last five years of this campaign has been very emotional, and let me tell you why. Because women, young, middle-aged and older, were told by surgeons and health boards, many with a conflict of interest, that they would be treated by a short procedure that was the new and I quote, gold standard in care. And after that, all would be well. Well, was it? If you call lacerated and ruptured organs well, if you call a severed urethra well, if you call being forced to use crutches or a wheelchair for the rest of your days well, if you call the loss of a kidney well, the end of your career well, the loss of your sex life well, the end of your relationship or marriage well, the loss of your house and life savings well, or your mental ill health, then yes, all as well. But the reality is, tens of thousands of women across the world live with chronic pain and mental pain, and a lifetime of hopes and dreams lost. Forced to struggle against the might of the medical establishment and the cosy relationship between big medical companies like Boston Scientific and Johnson & Johnson, surgeons, health boards, governments, and the MHRA, all of whom denied there was a problem, all of whom told the women they were imagining things or exaggerating. Month in, month out, my office staff and I worked with the Scottish mess survivors, led brilliantly by Elaine Holmes and Olive McElroy. We took them to meet the then Cabinet Secretary, Alec Neil, and we asked him to ban mesh. But at that time, he said he couldn't, as he feared being sued by the manufacturers. After numerous FOIs, PQs, and much lobbying, we found ourselves up against a brick wall. So we advised the women to take forward this petition. I'll never forget the day that it was presented to the committee. Dozens of sobbing women uh, sat hugging and supporting each other in solidarity in what David Stewart, the then convener, said was one of the most emotional days of his political career. The petition forced Alec Neil to suspend mesh, but not before yet more women had been implanted. We then forced the establishment of the so-called independent review in which Elaine and Olive sat. It met at least 10 times and unanimously agreed an interim report. Then the chair resigned, a new chair came in. No meetings took place in 10 months. Well, actually, they did take place. It's just that Elaine and Olive were not told off them, and no minutes were circulated. With the new chair in place, the final report was radically changed to the point where neither Elaine, Olive, or Dr. Agur could sign up to it, and all resigned. At this point, we met the new cabinet secretary and asked her to ensure that the mesh survivors' contributions were withdrawn before publication. We were assured this would happen, only for the report to be published without the changes being made. A shocking breach of faith. In the run-up to that event, over 100 MSPs from across parties signed a No Mesh Whitewash Pledge. Well, in view of the, Scottish mesh uh, the view of the Scottish mesh survivors is that this report is a whitewash and a big deep, murky barrel of it. Because on this review were four surgeons, Dr. Uh, Karen Guerrero, Dr. Valua, Valua Granatosis, Dr. Agur, and Mr. Paul Hilton. Three of them are subject to litigation by MESH survivors. None of them, none of them declared this conflict of interest before taking part in the review. And Mr. Paul Hilton, 
is one of the main witnesses for the NHS central legal office in the forthcoming civil action for damages brought by 420 patients in Scotland. His position and their position on MESH were predetermined before they took part in the review. And Mr Hilton also failed to declare that his wife, Dr Lucia Dolan, is also... Can, can I stop you there, please, yes. Mr Finlay? I would just like you to bear in mind that there may be sub matters here. Uh, could I say, um, President Officer, I have um, clarified this with the Chief Executive of the Parliament. Um, does the Cabinet Secretary, uh, sorry, Dr Lucia Dolan, is also subject to litigation in Scotland? So does the Cabinet Secretary still, after all of that, believe this review is independent? Will she allow the report to go for, out for public comment, as Jackson Carlow suggested? Will she agree to the indefinite suspension? Will the Cabinet Secretary tell the NHS to clear its shelves of mesh so it no longer can be used in Scotland? She has the procurement powers to do that. Will she end its purchase for use in Scotland? Will she write to the medical companies, urging them to settle litigation cases quickly and to stop their deliberate stalling? And finally, will she instruct a judge-led inquiry, similar to the Baby Ashes inquiry, into what is the biggest multiple litigation in the history of Scotland's NHS? President Officer, Scotland had the opportunity to lead the world on mesh. The, everyone was watching and we flunked it. The review, the review was compromised from the outset. The government have let down mesh victims. This is a tragic tale of corporate power and greed, institutional arrogance by the medical establishment, and government ambivalence and delay. President officer, only by refusing to give up have we got this far. Let me tell the Cabinet Secretary, we ain't going away. This is the last chance to make radical changes to the way forward, or we will bring political motions that seeks to unite the opposition on this issue. We now move to the open debate, and I would ask for speeches of around six minutes, please. I do have a little bit of uh, additional time in hand, so I can allow for interventions. And I have Alec Neil, please, followed by Brian Whittle. Thank you very much indeed, the Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I begin by reiterating what every speaker has said so far to pay tribute to the work of Elaine and Olive and all the MESH survivors and their campaign has been absolutely fantastic and well, well motivated and very, very effective. Can I also pay tribute to the Petitions Committee and in particular to the convener, uh, Joanne Lamont, and the Vice Convener, Angus MacDonald, who have done an excellent job so far, because there's still a way to go on this particular petition. And can I also pay tribute to the late Chrissy Bradchick, a Canadian campaigner who died last week of sepsis and who was in the process of suing Ethicon uh, for the way in which she was treated and was part of the Canadian MESH survivors group. Because this is not just a Scottish issue, this is a worldwide issue. And I thank Jackson Carlaw for reiterating my call for the Petitions Committee with the support of the full parliament to call an international conference to take coordinated action against those who are the real culprits in this, the manufacturers uh, of this mesh equipment that's been neither properly tested nor trialled before it was introduced worldwide. Can I also say, I hope that we can unite the whole chamber. This is not just about opposition against government. I think we all share these concerns and we all need to do and want to do what is right by the survivors and to prevent this happening again. Now, let me briefly say, presiding officer, uh, I'm going to be open and honest and very transparent. One of the reasons why I took longer to commission the independent inquiry than I did, because be quite frankly, and very unusually, I wasn't convinced by the information I was being provided for by uh, the official advisors when I was the cabinet secretary for health on this matter. On no other matter did I have any reason to doubt, but I increasingly felt as though I wasn't being told the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and I actually ended up doing a lot of research myself into the subject. And the more and more I researched the subject, the more and more I became convinced 
that we had to do something, that we had to, at the very least, suspend these procedures until we could be much more sure as to their safety. Uh, and I'm glad we did that. Uh, let me also, just for the record, can I make it very brief, Neil? Neil Finlay. Could I ask if he, he thinks that the same people who were advising him are the same people who are advising the Cabinet Secretary now? I have no, idea about, that was, I have no idea about that whatsoever. But also, just for the record, I made it absolutely clear that when we appointed members of the independent review group, that none of them should have a commercial interest in MESH. And that did not actually happen. And I'm very critical of the fact that it didn't happen. John Scott. And in his time as Cabinet Secretary, did he make any assessment of the potential contingent liabilities in terms of damages due and the class actions going on elsewhere in the world uh, to Scottish survivors of this mesh implant? Alex Neil. Well, we were very much aware of the legal proceedings, both potentially in Scotland and in the rest of the United Kingdom and indeed in the rest of the world. And that was one of the considerations in a bit of research. I found out more about myself rather than relying entirely on the official advice. And that reinforced my view that there was something seriously wrong here that had to be addressed. Now, previous speakers have already quite rightly addressed the whole procedure of the independent review and the very good and unanimously agreed interim report. But something happened between the interim report and the final report. One of the things that happened was in between those two reports, there was more research came out and that was never taken into account in the final report. But again, like Jackson Carlo, I thought that one of the best witnesses that came in front of the petitions committee, apart from the women themselves who were the best witnesses, was Dr. Rugger. And what the point he made and why he resigned as a member of the group. And I do honestly think that as well as reviewing the process, uh, the contents of this report are now so disrespected that we need to review the contents itself because, quite frankly, there isn't the universal agreement uh, to accept the contents as they stand. Now, fortunately, as the Cabinet Secretary outlined, we have made advances. A decision has been made in Australia, and I believe we should listen and learn from what they have decided there's the NICE guidelines and there's the GMC guidelines. But once all these guidelines are available, obviously we need to police them to make sure that in Scotland at least, these guidelines are adhered to and adhered to very well. But I don't believe that's going to be enough. There are another of other things that we need to do. I would ask the Cabinet Secretary to look at, and I very much welcome her comments about the establishment of the oversight group. But I think proper oversight in this case needs to have some form of patient involvement because one of the drawbacks in this whole procedure has been the patients feel and the survivors feel as though they have not been listened to. Now, that is not in any way to second guess or undermine the role of the medics. Clearly, none of us who are not trained can exercise medical judgment. But patients, particularly patients who are the survivors, have a lot of potential input into what to look for in an oversight arrangement. And Health Improvement Scotland uses lay members anyway in most of its inspections, and I believe we should look to using patients and involving patients in the oversight procedure. And there are two other things, presiding officer, that are important. And I mentioned in passing the current state of the leaflets, I will write separately to the Cabinet Secretary with the details of those, because there's a clear commitment from the Cabinet Secretary, quite rightly, to ensure that the leaflets are up to date and easily accessible and easily readable. There are three other things I think we've got to look at very, very quickly. One is, I think there should be an onus on any surgeon who has any commercial involvement with the producer of a product he or she is using on a patient to tell that patient they have a commercial interest in that product. Secondly, it is very clear the MHRA is not fit for purpose, it's partly funded by the mesh manufacturers, and I don't see how it can be truly independent. And thirdly, we must make sure that in future, 
when there is an independent review, it is genuinely an independent review, and we don't again, and I look forward to Professor Britton's report, we can never again have these processes tainted by the suspicions surrounding the outcome of this particular review. And I believe if we implement those, recommend, those suggestions, as well as all the other points made by uh, the previous speakers, and no doubt ones to come, then hopefully we'll get the right answer to this presiding officer and make sure that no other woman, or indeed no man, other man have to suffer, because some men have suffered as well, none of them have to suffer what these women have had to suffer and endure in some cases for the rest of their lives. Can I remind those in the public gallery that neither appreciation nor otherwise should be shown? <laughs> and I call Brian Whittle to be followed by Rona Mackay. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I firstly uh, refer uh, the Chamber to my register of interest in that I have a close family member who is a healthcare professional in the NHS. And I welcome the opportunity to speak in this debate today. Uh, and this issue has been in the Petitions Committee agenda since before my arrival in this place. And it's fair to say it has delivered some of the most harrowing of evidence sessions I've been involved in in my short time. It has certainly focused my mind on the fact that what we do in this place, amid all the other white noise of political debate, has a profound effect on the lives of people in Scotland. And in the case of today's debate, a topic that has far wider reach and implications than just within our own borders. It's not overstating the importance of this debate to suggest that the eyes of other nations are watching to see how this parliament deals with the continuing issue of polypropylene mesh implants. I also wanted to say, Deputy Presiding Officer, that the sight of the Cabinet Secretary and the Chief Medical Officer being cross-examined in committee by committee members and former members, with so many women affected by this procedure sat behind them, many in wheelchairs, mm -hmm. is one that is a vivid one. And it was uncomfortable to watch and listen to that evidence session with the reaction from behind uh, the Cabinet Secretary for those who seem so aghast. And the fact that the current committee was joined by Jackson Carlow, Alex Neil, John Scott and Neil Finlay highlights the cross-party strength of feeling and support for this campaign and the need for this parliament to join together and end this scandal. To that end, Deputy Presiding Officer, I want to add my sincere gratitude to the Scottish Mess Survivors Campaign, hear our voice for their unrelenting and resolute campaigning to try and ensure that what they have had to endure will be spoken about in public forum and that no one else need have their lives devastated by the potential repercussions of this procedure. This campaign also highlights the national and international impact that a public campaign can have through the Public Petitions Committee. But there are questions to be answered. Firstly, how a former health secretary in Alex Neil can take the robust action of imposing a moratorium on the use of transvaginal mesh only for certain health boards to continue to use the procedure to, to treat stress in urinary incontinence, with some 400 women undergoing this procedure since the moratorium. Who is ensuring that the moratorium has been adhered to? Who does the responsibility lie with? What are rules if they can't, uh, wh wh why do we set rules if there's no system to enforce those rules? Now, it was news to me and to many other MSPs, apparently, as well as the campaigners, that a moratorium called for by the government is not binding. This has to be an area of concern and something that this parliament must address. Had that mor moratorium held in the manner in which I believe it was, it was intended, we would not be in the position we find ourselves in today. And worse than that, however, is the debacle of the initial review and the resignations from the review board amid allegations of changing of language, of omissions of key evidence and finding from, the, from that review. I mean, ultimately, the, there seems to be clear evidence of an attempt to whitewash the issue. And I have to say, although we're not trying to be part of political here, I think the response from the government and the cabinet secretary in particular has been at best sluggish and indecisive. With that weight of evidence piled against the procedure, action could have and should have been clear cut by now. It was obvious to all that all was not well within that review panel. And for the involvement of the MHRA has already been mentioned in here, has been absolutely shocking. A body which, in which we place a great deal of trust and responsibility has been exposed as inadequate and incapable of, of applying any degree of logic and care. Now, and we've, had, we've had experts claiming that sufferers' pain could actually be psychosomatic. So at no point is there a duty of care or candor. 
And it was painful watching the new chair of the review board squirm in the chair under questioning during an evidence session, as, as Jackson Carroll has stated. Her answers were causing gasps from the woman seated behind her. A certain lack of empathy and understanding was all too evident. Now I have to agree with my colleague Jackson Carlo in his assertion that there must be a full public consultation on the content of the review which took place. And I also want to highlight, I also want consideration given to Alec Neil's proposal to convene an international summit here in Holyrood to allow Scotland to once again lead the way. Putting an end to this procedure is well overdue, Deputy Presiding Officer. The ban must remain in its entirety in the way in which it was originally intended. This must be, surely be a precursor to an end to this operation for good. I once again want to thank the petitioners for their courage and their persistence. And I would just like to close by assuring them that their voices are now certainly being heard. I call Rona Mackay to be followed by Monica Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Today's very important debate is one I wish wasn't happening because the circumstances surrounding it are shocking and upsetting, particularly to the thousands of women whose lives have been devastated by transvaginal mesh implants. This is not or should not be a political issue, as others have said. Long before I was elected, colleagues from across this chamber, particularly former Health Secretary Alex Neil, uh, Neil Finlay, Alison Johnson, John Scott, Jackson Carlow, and others have fought tirelessly to help women affected by this issue. I say it shouldn't be political because the mess survivors watching this couldn't care less about party politics. They're simply searching for answers, asking why this has happened to them and why a surgical procedure that was supposed to help them has ruined their lives. My former colleague, journalist Marion Scott, who spearheaded this campaign from day one along with mesh survivors Alien Holmes and Olive McElroy, didn't get involved with this campaign because it was a good story despite displaying the very highest standard of investigative journalism, all too sadly lacking these days. Marion has supported mesh sufferers because their pain and distress is all too visible. Their quest for justice, despite their suffering, was and is relentless. They deserve our full praise and admiration. However, presiding officer, mesh sufferers are not looking for praise. All of McElroy and Elaine Holmes do not want TV, TV cameras in their living rooms. They want answers. Before they knew each other, Olive and Elaine were trying to cope with the crippling after effects of surgery they were told would change their lives. Both had been told they were unique. They weren't. We now know thousands of women worldwide have been affected. Mothers, daughters, sisters, aunts, grands. The mesh survivors are not campaigning for themselves. They're not doing it for money. They're doing it so that no more women have to suffer as they have lives ruined, families shattered. I vividly remember seeing on TV in 2014 the joy and delight on the faces of the women led by Marion Scott at the committee meeting as a suspension on mesh implants introduced by Alex Neil was announced. However, as I understand it, since then at least 400 women have had a mesh tape implant to treat the very common condition of stress urinary incontinence since the suspension. Incidentally, for anyone who doesn't know what this tape implant looks or feels like, Imagine a bale of newspapers being bound by strong plastic tape, the kind of tape that cuts your finger if you touch it in the wrong way. That's what women are dealing with when it's put inside their bodies. Presiding officer, like everyone else in this chamber, I don't pretend to be a medical expert, but what I do know is that when clinicians can't agree, as we heard in Elaine Smith's powerful members debate on thyroid diagnosis and treatment a couple of weeks ago, it is the patient who suffers. And like the thyroid problem, the vast majority of mesh sufferers are women. And I'll leave you to draw your own conclusions on that. Presiding officer, the Scottish Government can't ban the use of medical procedures, but it can ask health boards to suspend their use, which is what was done. As a result of this petition, some progress has been made, albeit slowly, such as mesh should not be offered routinely to women, and all patients must have access to clear, understandable advice to help them make an informed choice. All appropriate treatments should be made available, subject to informed choice. A helpline has been established. Reporting of all procedures and adverse effects will be mandatory. A new oversight group, as we've heard, has been set up to ensure the conclusions are implemented. So progress, we are at last heading in the right direction. But it's the UK body, the MHRA, who decides what medical products are safe, and I believe we must 
put complete pressure on the MHRA, who, as Jackson Carlow and others have said, they've been in total denial over this issue from day one. We should say, what more proof do you need that this product is not safe? Here are the victims. Tell health boards this product is not available for use. Of course, there are clinical risks with every surgical procedure and side effects to all medicine taken. But when hundreds of women are so severely affected, then that risk is surely too great and we must stop doing it. Presiding officer, as a member of the Petitions Committee, um, I'm well aware of the serious issues that the report of the review and the review into the review throws up. The time doesn't allow me to delve into it and others have, have uh, outlined it uh, very well. Except to say that when those in authority in whatever field stop listening to the people at the centre of the issue, the people they're supposed to protect, it is a disaster. The Scottish Mesh Survivors Hear Our Voice campaign is an outstanding tribute to the courage and determination of the women determined to effect change. Those in power must start hearing their voice, albeit belatedly, before more women's lives are destroyed. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Monica Lennon to be followed by Alison Johnson. Please, Miss Lennon. <coughs> Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak in this debate today and I add my appreciation to the Public Petitions Committee for their work on this important petition this far. But most of all, I'm grateful for the incredible bravery and strength of the MESH survivors in Scotland, whose tenacity in campaigning to raise awareness of this issue has led us to the point we are at today. Like all, I believe, all of the MSPs in the Chamber, I am totally in awe of the strength and the passion of the women I've met who are part of the Scottish Mesh Survivors Group. Earlier this year, I joined parliamentary colleagues at a meeting with the Scottish Mesh Survivors, organised by my colleague Neil Findlay, who's been a long-time champion for the voices of the Mesh Survivors and has done some excellent work in raising awareness for these women, as have several other MSPs from various parties. Nothing can prepare you for the stories of these women. I can only imagine the pain that they have had to endure over the years. But I share their rage, their rage that this has been allowed to happen to them. All of the Scottish Mesh survivors, ordinary women with ordinary lives, have had their lives turned upside down by the implement, implantation of transvaginal mesh. Intending to address incontinence or pelvic prolapse, the insertion of polypropylene mesh was for many of these women a procedure they had been led to believe was first class, safe and would make their lives better. For so many of the women who have undergone these procedures, this could not have been further from the truth. As we now know, in many patients, the mesh began to break up, dispersing fragments throughout these women's bodies and causing incredible damage. Some of the women I met earlier this year told me about ruined relationships and careers, the daily struggle of having to live with chronic pain, the loss of the full use of their legs, and the unbelievable pain of having to deal with how these changes have utterly changed their lives, shattering hopes and dreams for the future. The implantation of mesh implants in women across Scotland on the NHS is a national scandal, and the way in which these women have been denied First by their doctors when these women expressed their concerns, told that they were imagining or exaggerating their symptoms, then by the big medical companies and now by governments tasked with investigating this whole debacle, it's nothing short of an outrage. During the drive to get MSPs to sign up to the Say No to Mesh whitewash pledge earlier this year, one of the women I met with told me about the experience she had when she first started having problems following mesh surgery. Her surgeon repeatedly told her that she was a unique case, the only one he had ever known to have been um, experiencing these adverse side effects. And for months, she was none the wiser. It was only through the discovery of the mesh survivor group and discussion with other women who had gone through the surgery, some with the same surgeon, that she discovered this doctor had been telling several other women the same thing. It is an absolute outrage that these women's health have been put so terribly at risk through this procedure. Because not only is the implement, implantation of mesh unsafe, but some practitioners and medical companies who advocate the use of mesh have clearly known about the dangers and yet have been complicit in misleading women about the dangers and effects. 
Earlier this year, uh, a few of us launched the, the cross-party group on women's health. I'm the convener alongside Alison Johnston, MSP, who is the vice convener. The purpose of the cross-party group is to inform Parliament and policymakers on a range of health issues which only predominantly or disproportionately affect women, to consider the impact which gender and inequalities has on women's health and their ability to access health care and treatment, and to empower women to make informed choices about their health and ensure they are treated with dignity and respect. In large part, the discussions I was having with a range of groups as my party's an equality spokesperson, sparked the need for this group to be established. And the experience of the women from the MESH survivors group absolutely played a role in the desire of these issues of women's health to be looked at more closely. The way in which so many of these women have been brushed off and disbelieved is outrageous, and it should never be allowed to happen again. These women deserve justice. So I echo the calls of my colleague Neil Findlay that the MESH scandal must be investigated with a judge-led inquiry that is truly independent of the Health Service and the Scottish Government. And I urge the Cabinet Secretary for Health to give this serious consideration. As a 2016 MSP, I'm fairly new to the parliamentary scrutiny of MESH. And I'm struggling to understand how health boards were able to disregard the moratorium and get away with it without any apparent consequence. So I asked the Cabinet Secretary if she can give an answer to that in closing. The MESH survivors in Scotland and across the world have been silenced, sidelined and brushed aside for too long. It is beyond time that their concerns were investigated seriously through a truly independent inquiry and that the calls of their petition are considered by the Scottish Government. I ask the Cabinet Secretary to give that um, her wholehearted commitment in closing. Thank you. I call Alison Johnson to be followed by Alec Cole-Hamilton. Ms Johnson, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I also wish to thank members of the Public Petitions Committee for their work on this critically important issue, to thank MSP colleagues who have supported the women and most of all, the MESH survivors themselves who've campaigned to make the risks of MESH surgery clear, to suspend these procedures in Scotland and to protect other patients from harm. Meeting the MESH survivors when they came to Parliament was eye-opening. Women of different ages and backgrounds gaining great strength by coming together, by realising, as Monica Lennon has just pointed out, that they weren't alone, they weren't unique, unfortunately. So I met this room packed with women, women reliant on wheelchairs and crutches. What chronic condition or illness was responsible for these life-limiting symptoms? Surgery here in Scotland. I spoke to women who'd worked in high-level roles in justice, in care, in services that we all rely on, no longer able to make a living, relying on others for help and support. No one appreciates more than the women themselves how debilitating how life-restricting incontinence can be. And while we all appreciate that surgery can never be guaranteed 100% safe or side effect free, to have such high hopes of life improving surgery, only to have such devastating outcomes in a group of patients is absolutely unacceptable. What is clear here is that the consent given to surgeons by these determined remarkable women was far from informed. And that's why their work in campaigning is so important. Incontinence is an issue affecting millions, yet it's rarely discussed in public. The MESH survivors have ensured that this will change. I'll never forget meeting one of the survivors attending with her husband. They explained how their relationship had been changed forever by this procedure. Imagine your partner going to hospital for surgery to treat incontinence and this resulting in them facing the rest of their life in a wheelchair. Incontinence considerably worsened, autonomy and self-esteem shattered, and physical intimacy a fading memory. I met a woman in tears because she was no longer able to lift up her beloved grandchildren. When we discussed reversing or rectifying the surgery, I too, as Neil Finlay has, heard from survivors that they'd been told that removing mesh could be likened to removing chewing gum from hair. 
I appreciate the forthright evidence that Elaine Holmes and Olive McElroy presented to the Public Petitions Committee in September and the detailed account Dr Agar gave of his involvement with the independent review, where he noted key differences between the interim report and final report as published. Dr Agar is firm that the final report didn't do enough to reduce harm and was too ambiguous about the risks of mess surgery, contrary to the evidence which analysed the long-term adverse effects of mess surgery, including mesh erosion and chronic pain. From Dr Agur's evidence, it is clear to me that at one point the work led by the Independent Review, Review, Review Group did indeed make it the first authority in the world to formally express concerns about a procedure that many clinicians and surgeons and other authorities around the world considered to be a gold standard. Scotland had an opportunity to show global leadership on MESH and I am, like other members in this chamber, extremely dismayed that the final report didn't reflect that. We missed the opportunity to lead then and we let down MESH survivors in the process. The Public Petitions Committee has reflected that Professor Alison Britton's report on the independent review will focus on the process that was followed and will not revisit the findings and recommendations of the report itself. In Dr Agur's view, recommending that transvaginal mesh procedures mustn't be offered routinely doesn't give sufficient clarity. I too believe that the findings of the report must be revisited. It's been well reported that draft guidance from NICE will acknowledge the serious, well-recognised concerns about transvaginal mesh and recommend that it is not used or only used in the context of research. I hope that the Cabinet Secretary will provide clarity on the Scottish Government's position on NICE's advice and whether advice for clinicians in Scotland will follow it, given the challenges the Government's own independent review faced. Will the work of the new oversight group change to reflect any updated advice? When the Cabinet Secretary made her statement on that review in March, she stressed that only the Medical and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency has the power to ban the use of mesh implants. But the forthcoming NICE guidance is clearly another way to restrict the practice of this surgery. Why then did health authorities in Scotland not take a similarly protective approach? Ultimately, I agree with Elaine Holmes and Olive McElroy that procurement is a matter for the Scottish NHS and the Scottish Parliament. The fact that it is a UK-wide body who decides if medical products are safe doesn't mean the Scottish NHS must buy everything on offer. Alex Neil has previously made his concern about the MHRA's independence and effectiveness as a body protecting public health clear to the Public Petitions Committee. I agree. Complete transparency regarding vested interests must be the norm. Presiding officer, work to improve reporting of adverse incidents related to medical devices is more urgent than ever. The case for imposing a real suspension of all transvaginal mesh procedures is stronger than ever. And I urge the Cabinet Secretary to open the final report of the Scottish Review of Mesh Surgery up to public, con public consultation. We must learn from the mesh survivors. We must make sure that they realise we hear your voice. We must leave no stone unturned in delivering justice for them, for making sure that not one more life is affected by these implants. We hear your voice. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms Johnson. I call Ali Cole Hamilton, followed by David Torrance. Mr. Cole Hamilton, please. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm very grateful uh, to the Petitions Committee for securing time today for us to address something that for every one of the hundreds upon hundreds of women who are mesh survivors in this country, that is nothing short of a public health disaster. I'm very proud to add my voice to some incredible and passionate speeches this afternoon. I want to put on record my thanks to you to Neil Finlay for the visit just described by Alison Johnson, where we and many members in this chamber met with mesh survivors, many in wheelchairs, all in abject pain. And this experience then prompted me to hold a members debate just two weeks ago on uh, the need for a national continent strategy, given that 80% of cases of incontinence can be alleviated with appropriate physiotherapy, but have in all too many cases led to the insertion of these potentially devastating implants using devices that were they ph pharmaceutical in nature may never even have made it out of trial phase. I was contacted over the weekend by a constituent of mine called Cathy, and she's given me permission to share her story with you now. 
In 2010, after suffering some very mild issues with incontinence, Kathy was referred by her physiotherapist to a consultant who suggested that she, sh she could undergo a marvellous new procedure. Somewhat bewildered, Kathy was asked to sign a consent form right then and there, and she said it felt it was like she was entering some kind of clinical trial, although it was never really spelled out to her quite like that. In fact, nothing was properly spelled out to her at all. And I think that speaks to the fact that if we credited these fully grown women with the facts about what was going to happen to them, they all might have made very different decisions. Despite being booked in for the more invasive tension-free vaginal, uh, vaginal transobdurator implant, which is secured via spikes through the obdurator muscle, Kathy received very little information other than it would cure her incontinence. When she awoke from surgery, she couldn't move. The nerve damage she had sustained in her obdurator muscles radiated pain throughout her abdomen, her legs, and her back. So bad was her condition that when she was discharged, she would not allow her son to travel more than 30 miles an hour along the bypass. From three days after that, all, uh, and all the following week, with no let up in the pain, she tried to call the hospital but never received a call back from either nursing staff or doctors. And had to add insult to injury and in the cruelest twist of irony, her incontinence worsened for a time. When she visited a doctor, she was told that the pain might be related to the fact she'd stopped smoking at the time of her operation. Or she should perhaps try cutting fat out of her diet as a means of helping. But at no point did any medical professional suggest that there could be a physical problem with the mesh implant. All told, Kathy went a full five years of trying to cope with abject pain before the cause was identified as being the mesh implant. A routine checkup with her gynecologist revealed that the tape was in far too tight on the right-hand side and as such was constantly tearing at her obdurator muscle. On seeking the advice of her surgeon, she received the devastating news that because her tissue had grown around the implant, it could not be removed without further significant nerve damage. Had someone taken her call at the hospital in the days after her operation, a reversal or correction could have been performed. Imagine her horror at receiving this news, considering also that at the time of her surgery, like she, like several others, had been told that the mesh plastic would simply melt away over time. Once the cause of the pain was identified as the physical obstruction within her, she was heavily medicated with gabapentin. And this, as always, had a very soporific effect on her, which indeed forced her to retire from the job she loved way, way before she planned to. Kathy's implant has had a significant impact on her mobility, on her intimacy with her partner, and on her mental health. For Kathy, the mesh implant has devastated her quality of life, and she is left with the Hobson's choice of making do or having it removed with potentially far greater nerve damage and resultant pain. As I stated at the top of my remarks, she felt rushed into that procedure. She wasn't clear of her options, and she had the impression that given the lack of understanding about possible side effects among the clinicians with, uh, whom, who tended to her, that she was part of some kind of clinical trial. She's far from alone in feeling like this. And indeed, I was contacted by another constituent yesterday called Tress, who underwent a similar procedure, but for, for a prolapse this time, resulting from a hernia in 2010. She's allowed me to read a very brief passage from the message she sent me as a message to you this afternoon. I feel it was an unnecessary operation, but was bullied into having it, being told it was my last option. I was not informed of the risks. My life has changed. I suffer from chronic pain as well as recurring infections, and I have to have antibiotics in the house at all times. I have been for investigations, but was told my mesh was safe. No, it's not safe. No mesh is safe. And we have lost several lovely ladies through, the, through having a mesh fitted. It is the human cost in Tress's words which underscore this as a public health disaster. At the end of October, the world lost Christina Lynn Brachick, a formidable Canadian mesh campaigner, to sepsis for the infection she has sustained relating to her mesh implant. She is part of an increasing death toll, and as such, I would like to add my voice uh, calling for, those, uh, for this petition to be kept open for a full and frank assessment of the final review, which I think we can see has crossed party consensus as now being unsafe, and for a policy response which protects patients in absolute terms from the horrors of mesh implant side effects with a full and continuing moratorium. Thank you. Thank you. 
I now call David Torrance to be followed by Michelle Ballantyne. Mr Torrance, please. Thank you, President Officer. Could I also put on record my thanks to the Public Petitions Committee and to MS Survivors Group. During my time in the Public Petitions Committee um, in the last session, we heard evidence from a range of different women, as well as from medical organisations, charity and many fellow MSPs. We listened to opinions and evidence of several patients. We were asked to reconsider the best mechanism for compiling research evidence and we analysed statistics as well as both patient and expert views in order to find out more about the nature and scope of the problem. We listened to women who had undergone surgery. The committee travelled to Brussels to give evidence to the EU Scientific Committee and the Committee on Petitions to update them on the work we had carried out in mesh implants. The committee listened to clinical experts locally as well as around the UK. The Scottish Public Health Network provided us with an object objective review of research literature alongside the Information Services Division of National Services Scotland. I can say with confidence that the evidence the committee took from a woman affected by mesh implants was the most emotional evidence myself and the committee members has heard during my time as vice convener. Some have experienced severe constant abdominal pain, infections and bleeding. Some have been left unable to have sexual intercourse, while others have been left disabled as a result of a procedure. Earlier last week, a Canadian well-known campaigner against the vaginal mesh procedures became the first woman to die in what has been known as the vaginal mesh scandal. I'm deeply saddened to hear that she had only minor complications that a sim simple procedure could have prevented. As she became immune to antibiotics, she was given as a result of major compl complications from the procedure. Her death comes just a week after a draft report of the UK's National Institute for Health and Care Excellence recommended banning the vaginal mesh as a routine for prolapse claiming that implants should only be used for research and not routine operations. Since 2014, more than 400 women in Scotland have gone through procedures since the Health Secretary called for their use to be suspended in June 2014. Although thousands of women have had implants over the last 20 years, many of them have experienced agonising and life-changing implications. Three years after their suspension, fierce debate still continues on whether or not these devices should be banned completely. However, the Medical and Healthcare Products Agency has found no evidence to indicate mesh implants are unsafe. In a report published in 2014, the MHRA claimed that by a small number of women had been affected by adverse implications, the benefit of tape and mesh implants outweighed the risks that could have helped in dealing with upsetting conditions. However, while the MHRA announced that only 12 women UK-wide had reported cases to them, over 3,000 women have undergone repeated operations in an attempt to resolve any problems and complications from surgery. What this debate over the last few years has shown us is there's a serious lack of information that has been circulated in Scotland regarding this surgery. In line with the recommendations, patients should be provided with the information they need in order to make informed choices. It's outrageous that some of the women who had experienced problems told us that they were not aware that the implants were permanent. Informed consent should be introduced fully and uniformly throughout Scotland's health boards, and I would encourage the MHRA to reclassify TVM devices to heighten an alert status to reflect ongoing concerns, not just in Scotland, but worldwide. Informed consent is a fundamental principle underlying all healthcare interventions, and it is extremely important that women know the ins and outs of a procedure before agreeing to it. What is most appalling, however, is that some of the women who had adverse effects felt they were not believed adding to the distress and increasing the time before any remedial intervention could take place. Women felt that their voices had not been heard as they raised concerns about the side effects a number of, of them had suffered. Many of them eventually felt that the only way to bring this to the attention of the Scottish Parliament was to lodge a petition bringing the issue to the attention of the Public Petitions Committee. There is without doubt a serious possibility that the implant will continue to have a profound impact on the lives of many Scottish women. I'm pleased that this is a general agreement in the conclusion of the session's public petitions committee. And we need to revise and enhance governance around both the launch of new medical procedures and approaches. We need to give women more opportunities to report any adverse effects should they arise. And we need to reevaluate how women are assessed and treated. The lack of understanding of effects of implant means that the government and the key stakeholders need to ensure that the guidance which is given to NHS and clinicians are based on the most robust, up-to-date and accurate evidence. Similarly, good inf information is essential to good potential uh, patient care. These women need a lot more than they are currently providing them with, including adequate time for discussion and reflection, making them aware of patient choice and shared decision-making supported by robust clinical governance. 
ult ultimately, we need to sh see the recommendations as well as the evidence from women affected being reflected in the patient safety clinical governance strands of the NHS. While the debate will continue and what the government needs now to progress further is to cooperate with key stakeholders to address information gaps and ensure the available information is used effectively as possible to support safe and effective care. In conclusion, the Scottish Parliament asked, must act to, under restraints of a lack of authority in regards to withdrawing the product. Moving forward, it is our job as policymakers to challenge the status quo and to represent these women so their voices are not drowned out. I ask my fellow MSPs to support the continued suspension of TVM implants and to expose some of the false information that has currently been circulated regarding this potential life-altering procedure. Thank you, Mr. Coffey. I call Michelle Ballantyne to be followed by Willie Coffey, and Mr. Coffey will be the last speaker in the open debate. Ms. Ballantyne, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I would like to first echo the sentiments of gratitude towards Elaine and Olive for bringing this petition and for their unyielding courage to share their stories with us and the world. I am relatively new to this petition, and indeed I am new to the Public Petitions Committee itself, but after just one meeting, hearing of their strength and courage through adversity, their will to stand up and speak out on behalf of MESH survivors across the country, I can empathise fully with their resentment and dismay towards the review process, not least because I have undergone a MESH procedure. Presiding officer, I think it is important that these women are heard today because their words, their own words, shaped through pain, angst and frustration, should resonate with us all as human beings as well as parliamentarians. They said their voices were drowned out and stifled. They said they endured adversity and pressure for almost three years as patient representatives on the review group. They said they felt physically sick upon reading the final report. These words encapsulate what we heard at committee, that the recommendations of this report will not reduce the harm to patients from this procedure. And those are not my words, presiding officer. Those are the exact words of Dr. Agur in his evidence to the committee. He told us in no uncertain terms what MESH can do. He spoke of MESH tape procedures causing chronic pain, and he expounded upon the devastating problems this can cause in terms of intimacy in a relationship. Dr. Agur has performed MESH procedures, many of them. He speaks from a place of experience and expertise, and he is quoted telling of his incredible pride when he joined the re review group to protect women in the future. That pride was short-lived, supplanted by dejection. He now says Scotland failed to live up to expectations. And since NICE have recommended banning the use of vaginal mesh operations to treat pelvic organ prolapse in England, the powerful words of Dr. Agur take on a new profundity. Now, of course, presiding officer, hindsight is a wonderful thing. We must remember that this procedure was at first wholeheartedly embraced by the profession and by patients as a simple, quick and life-changing solution to really troubling medical problems. It would be quite wrong to blame all, all, sorry, it would be quite wrong to direct all blame at the surgeons and specialists like Dr. Agur, who performed these procedures in the expectation of improving their patients' quality of life. But it has become very clear that procedural and regulatory deficiencies have been abundant. It has been acknowledged at committee that there was no robust framework for ensuring fully informed consent. Even, indeed, even when the adverse consequences of MESH entered broader medical perception, heads remain firmly buried in the sand. And unfortunately, presiding officer, as my colleague Jackson Carlaw has highlighted, the whitewash of this report indicates that some heads are still there. Survivors, professionals, experts and politicians are speaking with one voice. And with that voice we ask, did the MHRA have an undue influence in the arrangement of this report? Why was chapter six deleted from the final report? And why is the report engineered in such a way to exhibit the benefits of mesh for incontinence while obfuscating the potential for mesh erosion? Damage to reputation does not justify it. A loss of funding from manufacturers does not justify it, and fear of litigation does not justify it. In closing, presiding officer, the review report does not, should not, and cannot justify lifting the suspension of polypropylene transvaginal mesh operations. When we make decisions on this issue, we should be able to look Elaine, Olive, and all survivors in the eye 
and honestly and transparently say, this will protect women from the pain you endure. This is the right way forward. I do not believe the Cabinet Secretary can do that today, not based on this report. No amount of whitewash can conceal the facts. When Australia and New Zealand are banning the procedure, when legal actions are taking place all over the globe, and when acclaimed academics are describing the procedure as a catastrophe, one has to question why the Scottish Government is dragging its feet. The Scottish Government must set aside obstinacy in favour of engagement. So I urge them, act decisively, ban MESH before it ruins more lives. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Can I, can I just politely remind members in the gallery that it is not appropriate to clap. I understand why you're doing it. But it's not appropriate when the Parliament is sitting in session. Thank you. Um, I now call Willie Coffey, who's the last speaker in the open debate. Mr Coffey. Thanks very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, like many of the members have spoken today, I was made aware of the issue as a result of representations made to me by constituents and listening to their experiences firsthand at my local surgeries. I also sat in, in one of the petitions committee meetings where a number of women affected by the mesh implants attended and who also offered their time throughout that particular day to provide more information to MSPs on the conditions they were now enduring in their daily lives since undergoing their procedures. Some of that was pretty harrowing and I have to say in my 10 years in this place, I haven't come across many cases like these from constituents. The issues are very challenging and while I wouldn't pretend to understand all of the medical complexities involved, I hope the debate at least allows those concerns of all the affected women to be heard in this parliament and for some hope to be given to those concerns that are being listened to and acted upon. The review carried out by the Scottish Government, notwithstanding the disagreements about what was or wasn't included in the final report, at least went some way to meet the initial demands of the petitioners in terms of achieving a suspension of mesh procedures, mandatory reporting of all adverse events, and bringing in fully informed consent, and of course the call for the, the review itself. Further safeguards must also be put in place by health boards before any procedures are reintroduced. And as we know, in respect of the POP, the pelvic organ prolapse, the current evidence did not indicate that any additional benefit from the use of mesh, and it's not to be offered routinely, as other members have said in the chamber this afternoon. I have to say that some of the conclusions of that review, I think, could reasonably have been put in place at the outset, especially in relation to issues about provision of information and consent and mandatory reporting of any adverse events. Why on earth this wouldn't be routine in, in any case for such procedures with known risks associated with them is a bit of a mystery to me and to some of the women that I spoke to. Presiding officer, I also had a look at the MHRA uh, report that was carried out in 2014. As members know, they are the UK body who have the sole authority to withdraw these products or not. Their conclusion then was that the benefits of the use of mesh devices outweighed the risks involved. And there was no justification for taking action to remove all such devices from UK hospitals. Those are words directly from their own report. But in saying that, I looked to see in the report how that conclusion had been reached, given the numbers of adverse incidents being reported subsequently. Interestingly, the MHRA themselves don't have any, any data showing the numbers of mesh devices that had been implanted. Instead, they were relying on sales figures to get an indication. Their data showed that for SUI devices between 2005 and 2013, there were 29 variants of those devices, 170,000 sold in the UK, and around 291 adverse incidents reported in England. Remember, this was English data at the time. And for the POP devices, about 25 variants of those, with about 24,000 sold in the UK, and about 110 adverse reports. My, my point here, presiding officer, is that I couldn't see in the report any comment on the statistical significance of, or otherwise of this data. And that leads to the conclusion, and how that led to the conclusion that the devices were safe. One incident is a matter for great regret, but over 400 during that period were reported, but there was no assessment of whether that was what should be expected statistically. 
So I'm still wondering how they can conclude that the devices themselves are safe if they don't address and dismiss the numbers of incidents in terms of statistical probability. Perhaps that's something we could clarify or attempt to clarify even with the MHRA. Um, presiding officers, members have already commented on the very sad news from Canada where Christy Bracek, who was treated with a mesh device for mild urinary incontinence, has, has died recently. No doubt that tragic news will mean further demands to reconsider these procedures will be made and a more rigorous assessment of risk and the potential impact on women should those risks materialise may well be given more prominence now. I said at the outset that it's impossible for us as lay people to analyse and assess the evidence and impact of these mesh devices and the women who have come forward. But we have to listen, offer a forum for concerns to be heard and to expect those on whose professional judgment we rely to get this right. But that can't be the end of the story. The numbers of women affected asked adversely by these procedures may be small in relation to the total numbers of procedures being carried out, but the impacts are particularly severe when they occur. Confidence is everything here. We have to be challenging our clinicians more about the risks involved, and we have to restore that confidence to women involved before we proceed any further with these mesh procedures. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now move to closing speeches. I call on Anna Sarwar to close for Labour. Mr Sarwar. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I start by thanking uh, Joanne Lamont and the Petitions Committee for uh, bringing forward this important debate today and for giving Parliament the opportunity uh, to contribute to their uh, deliberations. I, I think today we've heard the best of our Parliament. We've heard uh, stories from across the Chamber, uh, a story of courage, uh, an emotion of strength and determination uh, and of dignity. Dignity and determination in the face and the might of Scotland's medical establishment. And we've heard about the campaign driven by a group of women who have been forced to struggle every step of the way against a medical establishment which has closed ranks to protect their own. And just like every other member that has spoken on this debate so far, I want to pay tribute to all the survivors, many of whom who are in the chamber today, for their bravery, for their determination and their courage and not taking no for an answer and pursuing this issue, not just to get justice uh, for themselves, but to make sure they can protect patients uh, in the future too. So I want to pay tribute uh, to Elaine, to Olive, and to all the campaigners uh, for the determination and the dignity in which they continue to campaign. Uh, we've heard in the debate today how medics close ranks to protect their own reputation. Uh, we've heard how the med medical establishment close ranks to protect their relationships with medical companies. We've heard of the women affected have had to fight to even have their case heard. And I want to praise the work in particular of my colleague Neil Finlay in steadfastly supporting the women affected and ruthlessly pursuing the truth. But also to thank other parliamentarians of other political parties, also in particular Jackson Carlaw of the Scottish Conservatives and Alec Neil, who was a previous health secretary and who has continued to campaign passionately and principally on this cause uh, since vacating that position. I want to thank them too, in particular, alongside Neil Finlay uh, and the women uh, who have continued to campaign to this day throughout Scotland. Uh, without their campaigning, uh, we would still be having mesh implanted into women's bodies with the consequences that are now well evidenced. We would not be standing here today debating the use of a procedure and a product that is causing so many women to face a lifetime of chronic pain if it wasn't for that campaigning spirit, both in this parliament and outside of this parliament. But, presiding officer, this debate comes fundamentally down to one word, confidence. The reality is that the survivors of this scandal do not have confidence in what has happened since that scandal. The review is compromised, and we have to accept the review is compromised. The MHRA is compromised and we have to accept that they are compromised. And government action, I'm sorry to say, and I don't mean this in a party political point at all, but I'll come to how I think we can move forward in a moment, I think is also compromised. And unless we can give the survivors of this mess scandal the confidence that their government, that the institutions 
and the medical establishment is working in their favour and for their justice rather than against what is in their interest, we can never deliver justice for the survivors of the mess scandal. So confidence is absolutely crucial going forward. How we create a climate of confidence in the review process, the actions that come out of that review, and what happens long term in terms of the use of this product. Because there has been a cover-up. For medics to fail to declare a conflict of interest while serving on a review body is simply unacceptable. If that was a parliamentarian taking part in a committee process where they had a conflict of interest, they would be hauled before the Standards Committee and they would be rebuked in this parliament. If it's not acceptable for a parliamentarian to behave in that way, it is not acceptable for anybody of any profession who serves in a so-called independent review to behave in that way either. The fact that there is litigation over the use of a product and those people who are facing that litigation serving on that committee and failing to declare that interest is shameful behaviour, which actually brings both the conduct of that review and actually the wider conduct of medical professionals, I think, into disrepute. And I think we should call that out for what it is. Because the evidence of the misuse of a product that is not fit for purpose is clear. In the US, manufacturers of this product have already paid out over £1.5 billion in compensation. And what I don't think the survivors want to hear is that somehow this may be a cover-up to try and protect money for public purse or indeed private companies' money rather than seeking justice. And that's why what we do going forward is so important. The fact that the NICE has banned the use of mesh operations in England speaks for itself. The fact that this product is banned in Australia and New Zealand also <coughs> speaks volumes. The use of this product was wrong and its consequences have been lifelong. And today we have an opportunity to put that right. More than 100 MSPs have already put their name to a call for an honest and transparent review. A review not compromised by the actions of the medical establishment, but a review that is, uh, has process at its forefront and is not tainted by a cover-up. Because we cannot allow this parliament to look like it's part of a cover-up. That's why we need to hear a commitment from the cabinet secretary that there will be a judge-led inquiry to bring this tragic and murky scandal into the full light of public scrutiny. A review that will give women the chance to be listened to. A review that will lead to action being taken against those culpable. And that's why nothing less than a judge-led review will suffice. I just want to end with some specific and direct questions to the Cabinet Secretary. And I say this in all sincerity. We have an opportunity, I think, from the way the debate has been conducted to bring all our parliaments, all our parties, sorry, together, whether it's opposition or in government, to get to the bottom of this and to give justice to the mesh scandal people. And I think the Cabinet Secretary has an opportunity following this debate to unite our parliament in that process. But I want to repeat what Alec Neil said. The truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth. For a former cabinet secretary to say that he didn't believe he got that from his most senior officials when he was a cabinet secretary in this parliament of a Scottish government is damning. It is absolutely damning. And I don't think we should take that lightly. And we've got to understand whether those people are still giving the same advice to this cabinet secretary. And if they are, how we expose it and make sure that changes. How we make sure that when we have a moratorium, it actually means a moratorium. That actually we review mess procedures, not just in women, but as we've heard from Alec Neil again, from procedures in men also who are undergoing uh, complications. How we actually genuinely have an independent review. Whether we'll open it up to the public for public comment before we have final publication of a review whether we have the indefinite suspension of MESH, whether we will use the powers of our parliament and the procurement powers to end the purchase of this product, and whether we will actually settle the litigation cases quickly to stop deliberate stalling by companies. Anything less than that will be a failure and a betrayal of the women sitting in that gallery today. Anything less will betray the best of this parliament and the best of our country. And that's why working together, I hope, across this parliament, across all political parties, we can once and for all give justice to the mess survivors in Scotland. And this never happens again. Uh, thank you very much. Can I call Miles Briggs to close to the Conservatives, please? Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm pleased to close today's debate, which I think 
presented a useful and thoughtful discussion. Like others, I'd like to pay tribute to current and former members of the Parliament's Public Petitions Committee for the consistent work they've done on this subject over a number of years. Today's debate is another good example of the important role that the Public Petitions Committee plays in the political process of our modern Scotland. And like other members, I also want to commend the original petitioners, Elaine Holmes and Olive McElroy, who have done so much work to speak out for those who have suffered as a result of receiving mesh implants and tape procedures. And I'd like to welcome all those in the public gallery today who have campaigned so hard. I just hope today, as politicians, Parliament has given you a voice and done you justice. A number of members have spoken in detail about the horrendous health impacts some women have experienced as a result of mesh implants and tapes for prolapses and stress incontinence. As a newly elected MSP, I, along with many other MSPs, first met with the MESH campaigners in Parliament following the publication of the draft report of, of the review committee. I have to say, having met them that day, how angry I felt going home. Angry that these women, who were in good faith, desperately seeking answers, had been put in a position where the review committee and report they, had, would provide the, they hoped would provide and challenge and seek, seek the answers and clarity that they had been looking for had been compromised and a whitewash of a report finally published, which helped no one. These women have been badly let down. The whole cha chamber will have personal sympathy for them, but they don't want sympathy. They want answers and they want action. Jackson, Jackson Carlaw expressed very clearly the frustration and anger of MESH campaigners over the course of the last few years. It took a great deal of pressure before the then Health Secretary, Alex Neil, announced the independent review in June 2014. The Health Secretary also at that time announced the suspension of the use of mesh implants. But we know that half of Scotland's health boards continue to use these devices, with over 400 procedures having been carried out despite that ban. And I think it's a very important point developed by both my colleagues Brian Whittle and Michelle Ballantyne, raising real concerns about the role and impact of ministerial directives on NHS health boards in, in Scotland. And Monica Lennon also pointed this question. Why, when we have these directives, are they being blatantly ignored? And how can cabinet, the Cabinet Secretary and Scottish Government have been totally disregarded by some Scottish health boards when they put this out? And I think that's something all of us in this chamber will want to see addressed. During this time, hundreds of women have received mesh tape implants, despite the position of the Scottish Government and the continuing worries about their safety and the fact that the NHS in Scotland is facing several hundred damages, damages claims from women who have been affected. And having been involved from the outset, I thought we saw three great speeches today from Jackson Carlaw, Neil Finlay and Alec Neil, who made some point, real pointed speeches today. All three demonstrated how the contents of the report have been compromised and now diminished. And I also very much endorse Alec Neil's call for patient involvement and their experiences in any future guidelines. But the fact is that the Cabinet Secretary has had to appoint Professor Alison Britton of Glasgow Caledonian University to, do, to conduct a report into how the inquiry process was undertaken. That only highlights the extent of the concerns which still are around this. In recent weeks, we have seen a major new development with the news that NICE is set to rec recommend that mesh operations should be banned from treating organ prolapse. It's understood that the draft guidelines from NICE say that the implant should only be used for research and not routine operations. And that, and I quote, evidence of long-term efficacy for implants treating organ prolapse is inadequate in quality and quantity. NICE's move will mirror a similar decision by equivalent bodies in Australia and in New Zealand. It also comes at a time when more very, when more very worrying academic evidence has been produced around mesh erosion rates. To conclude, Deputy President Officer, NICE's guidance should act as a further wake-up call for the Scottish Government and should also prompt it to take decisive action to ensure that, it is inter in, that no interpretation of the current suspension of the use of mesh in order to prevent any more women or men being harmed. Patients in Scotland deserve better than the response to this major issue which has been provided to date. I agree with Jackson Carlaw and Alec Neil that the Scottish Government should act now, I think, to, to convene an international summit here in Holyrood to allow Scotland to help to seek the answers and once again gain the political initiative to seek these answers for families. I hope this debate will help push ministers 
to address in full the genuine and legitimate concerns of MESH campaigners and to ensure that the safety of patients is always the overriding priority when the use of such invasive surgery and new technology is actively being considered. Deputy Presiding Officer, on the 7th of November, the First Minister apologised on behalf of the Scottish Government to gay men convicted of now abolished sexual offences. That was a welcome moment in this Parliament's history and saw parties across the chamber come together as an injustice was addressed and acknowledged and saw the Scottish Government take action. For women and their families across Scotland who have been so clearly failed, I believe the Scottish Government and this Parliament now needs to make amends. There's a lot of work to do to regain the confidence of women and families affected by this mesh scandal. But it's time now that Scottish Government ministers acted and once again made Scotland a leading beacon for all those who have been affected by this mesh scandal and survivors of this mesh scandal. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Briggs. I call on Shona Robinson to close the Government Cabinet Secretary. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, can I thank members for their contributions uh, to this afternoon's important debate? Uh, and I'll try to respond to as many points as possible that have been made. And I do hope that we can work together uh, to go forward on uh, this important issue, as other members have said. Uh, I want to, first of all, touch on the role of the MHRA. Uh, many members have raised concerns and referred to the key role in on, being the only organisation that can ban a procedure or a product. And just to highlight what I said in my opening remarks, that it is important that the MHRA do take account of international evidence uh, emerging and the, the action taken by other uh, areas, um, such as the Australian Therapeutic <coughs> Goods Administration. And that's why the Chief Medical Officer has written to the MHRA asking what their response is to the action taken by the Australian Therapeutic Goods Administration to remove mesh for pelvic organ prolapse and single incision mini slings, not for stress urinary continence, I have to add. So it's very, it must be very clear what it is they have done. And it is focused on removing mesh for pelvic organ prolapse and single incision mini slings. And we await the response of the MHRA uh, on that issue. Now, yes, sorry, I promised I would let you in, absolutely. John Scott. I appreciate, thank you for letting me in. And given the alleged conflict of interest of the MHRA, and given the source of some of their funding, does the Cabinet Secretary think that it's time for a review of their corporate governance arrangements? And is this something the Cabinet Secretary might consider pursuing? Cabinet Secretary. Well, look, I'm, I'm happy to uh, pursue that. We have raised a number of concerns about the role of the MHRA, um, not least from points made by members in this chamber. We have regularly put to the MHRA and the Department uh, of Health, which has oversight of the MHRA. So I'm happy to, to, to do that. Many issues um, have been raised about the independent review process. Um, and I'll come on to one specific issue in a moment, but I think we should allow Professor Britton to carry out uh, her review, uh, which will look at uh, all of the issues raised uh, during this debate, and, and not least the issue that I think was raised by Alec Neil and, and uh, I think might have been Neil Finlay as well, about how interests are disclosed and registered. And I think not just for this uh, independent review, but for future independent reviews about any issue. Uh, it is important that there's full disclosure of interests uh, and uh, um, that those are registered. So I'll, the Pro Professor Britton will be looking at that issue along with the many other issues that have been raised about the independent review process. Neil yes. Finlay. She's just said, and I think that's very important, is it now your view that, this, uh, that the review itself was compromised by that? I certainly understand the concerns uh, about the review process. I wouldn't have asked Professor Britton to look at the independent review if I didn't have concerns. That doesn't detract, though, from the important recommendations that the review has made. And indeed, in the, the issue of, um, of POP has uh, effectively uh, restricted uh, that, that procedure uh, to exceptional cases only. And I'll come on to NICE uh, in a minute in terms of taking that uh, even further. So it is important, I think, to recognise, as other members have, that some of those recommendations are very, very important. Um, members have asked, uh, 
how procedures could have still uh, gone ahead uh, in the light of the, the suspension, the moratorium um, of uh, uh, mesh procedures. And I, as I've said in this chamber uh, before, uh, in a, a small number of cases uh, where uh, the, a woman, in absolutely fully informed of the risks, still wanted to go ahead with the procedure because they were experiencing very distressing symptoms and wanted to proceed, uh, if that was a clinical judgment um, that was reached in a fully informed discussion between the clinician and the patient, then because this procedure is not banned, there was nothing that could be done to stop those procedures going ahead. Now, I understand members' frustration about that, but you know these are clinical decisions and this is a procedure that is not banned. However, it is very important going forward that the restrictions that are placed uh, on the use of mesh are fully implemented and consistently so. And I'll come on to say uh, a bit more about that in a second. I'll, Yes. Joanne Lamont. I wonder if the Cabinet Secretary can clarify what she understands the moratorium to be and what advice she was given and what her predecessor expected a moratorium to be. Cabinet Secretary. Well, I can't speak for what Alec Neil wanted to happen. I assume the same as me, that boards would um, suspend those procedures, but we were fully aware that it is not a banned procedure and therefore if a clinician with a fully informed patient who wanted that procedure to go ahead then there is nothing that could be done to prevent that because it is not a banned procedure i've explained that in this chamber a number of times it might be frustrating for members but that is that those are the facts it is not a banned procedure the only organization that can ban this procedure is the mhra and i've already said uh, what uh, we are doing to make sure they are more fully informed. Um, very briefly, because I've got some points to come. Brian Whittle. Thank you. I appreciate you taking another intervention. Can I be I do recognise the MHRA are the only ones that can actually withdraw this uh, particular uh, device. But surely, uh, uh, the NHS, as the NHS fund these operations, you have the capability of taking away that funding, therefore the procedure couldn't go ahead. Cabinet Secretary. I don't think that, I'm not a clinician. Uh, I am not a clinician that can make a judgment about withdrawing funding from a procedure that is not a banned procedure. I really, I think that gets us into very, very difficult territory indeed. We have to be guided by what the clinical advice is. Now, if the MIHRA are going to look at the issue again, and as I understand, they are continuing to look at the international evidence on this issue, and are continuing to do so, and. Uh, I, as I understand, will be looking at this. Not, not at the moment, I want to make some progress. Uh, they, are, they will be looking at the Australian evidence and indeed other evidence, and I hope that they do uh, keep that under review. And, you know, I would like them to reach a different conclusion, but so far, that is not the conclusion they have reached. Alison Johnson asked a very important question about the NICE guidance. And first of all, uh, it's very, very important to understand what the NICE guidance is saying, because it is... What they're saying on pelvic organ prolapse is that it could only uh, be uh, delivered as a procedure for research purposes only. They have been clear that they can't ban mesh procedures. It is only guidance. So I have to be very clear on that. NICE have been very clear. They cannot ban that procedure. It is guidance. But it is guidance that we will follow. The NHS in Scotland always follows uh, NICE uh, uh, interventional guidance um, in the same way as would uh, be the case in the rest of these islands. So I hope that reassures Alison Johnson that absolutely that further restriction beyond what the restrictions that are already in place for POP, uh, I think, is um, important. And the oversight group will incorporate that additional guidance into the, the guidance that they are developing. And finally, on Alec Neil's point about patient involvement, because I thought Alec Neil made a number of important points. Probably the most important one was how are patients going to be involved in the oversight group going forward. I can confirm absolutely that patients will be involved. Now, I understand the trust issue that uh, many of the women involved, not least uh, Elaine and all of themselves, it would be very hard and perhaps uh, unreasonable to ask them to be involved in any other processes. Personally, I would hope that they would consider that. And the other women who have had personal experience are exactly the women that we would want to be involved in the oversight group 
taking this issue forward, developing the leaflets uh, for women that, are, uh, that can make sure that people have the, the full information and can make fully informed decisions. So I would certainly hope that, that patients will uh, be involved in that process because I think it will make the procedures and the, the work of the oversight group very, very important and perhaps can help to rebuild the confidence in the material that is being put out uh, to help uh, make sure patients are fully informed about any procedure that they undertake uh, in this area. Uh, I'm sorry if I've not been able to respond to all members. I know there were some specific uh, questions uh, that uh, perhaps I've not been able to come back to, but I certainly will write to members to make sure that they get the, the full information that I've not been able to cover in my closing remarks. Thank you very much. I now call on Angus MacDonald to close for the Public Petitions Committee. Mr MacDonald, please. Okay, thank you, uh, President Officer. Um, how long do I have? How long do you wish? <laughs> Nine minutes. Yeah. That's absolutely fine by me. I might even give you ten. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm certainly pleased to be able to close this debate on behalf of the Public Petitions Committee, and I thank members across the Chamber for their excellent contributions this afternoon. Uh, and I'll turn to their individual contributions in a short while. Uh, as the convener mentioned in opening the debate, this petition was lodged during session four, and I've been a member of the committee throughout the consideration of the petition uh, to date. In that time, a wide range of evidence has been presented from the petitioners and the Scottish Government, and also from relevant parties. And I think it's fair to say that the strength of feeling and the emotions evident at each of the evidence sessions where the petitioners and fellow sufferers have been present has been tangible. The substantial amounts of evidence we've taken has included a lawyer representing mesh damaged women who are involved in litigation in America and the Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency, which is responsible for licensing medical devices in the UK. And as been made clear throughout this afternoon's debate, there's no doubt as to the seriousness of the issue raised by this petition and the physical and emotional impact of adverse events arising from mesh, mesh procedures. And it's clear that it was partly thanks to this petition, um, if not wholly thanks to the petition, that the Scottish Government asked health boards to suspend the use of mesh in 2014 due to the clinical concerns, which clearly reflects the seriousness that the Scottish Government attaches to the issue. And I also have to um, congratulate Alec Neil, commend Alec Neil uh, for the action that he took as Health Secretary, Secretary introducing a suspension and review until all the necessary procedures, approvals and restrictions are in place. <coughs> now, the petition asked for several things, including suspension of all mesh procedures, the establishment of an independent review, mandatory reporting of adverse events, and the introduction of fully informed consent. Now, much of that has been or will be achieved as a result of the original petition. So I join the convener and other members in paying tribute to the work of the petitioners on putting this issue in the spotlight. Now, during the course of the debate um, this afternoon, we've had valid and salient points raised by Jackson Carlaw in a strong contribution, who is a former member of the PPC, <coughs> asked searching questions during our evidence sessions and has raised a number of these points this afternoon, not least the woeful performance of the MHRA uh, when they gave evidence to the committee. Another member who has doggedly pursued this issue as it went through committee and has worked on the issue out with the committee system is Neil Finlay, who's made a significant impact in the campaign and continues to raise concerns regarding the way the whole issue has been handled, as we've heard today. Uh, Alec Neil uh, made a heartfelt and candid contribution to today's debate, including his call to review the contents of the initial review. Uh, and he, he's also, um, both at committee in September and today in the chamber, suggested an international mesh summit to address the growing global concerns, uh, glo global crisis. And now there's much merit in this, however, I think it may be beyond the capacity of the Public Petitions Committee to conduct such a summit. However, I'm sure it's something we can consider for the forthcoming committee report, which will hopefully be completed in the not too distant future. Uh, Rona Mackay detailed the recommendations from the review and along with other members rightly questioned the role of the MHRA. Monica Lennon spoke of the rage being felt by the MESH survivors, referring to the whole issue as a national scandal and an outrage, along with her call for a judge-led review. Uh, Alison Johnson highlighted lack of informed consent, consent 
and concentrated on much of the evidence given to the committee by Dr. Agur. David Torrance uh, highlighted the successful visit the Public Petitions Committee made to Brussels under the convenership of Dave Stewart, where we made sure that this issue uh, was well and truly on the radar of the European Commission. Michelle Ballantyne, a new member of the Public Petitions Committee who has made a strong contribution to the committee's work since she arrived, uh, highlighted Dr Agur's evidence to committee during which he detailed the adverse impacts of mesh implants. And Willie Coffey spoke of the harrowing evidence which was given to committee when he was present. Uh, Brian Whittle, amongst many uh, salient points, que questioned the failure of the moratorium to be fully implemented. Uh, and in addition, um, Alec Cole Hamilton went on to in, into some detail of the situation his constituent had endured. So we've had excellent contributions uh, from the, the, the floor of the chamber uh, today, and I'm sorry I can't dwell on uh, many of the other points that have been raised. In the closing speeches, Anna Sarwar uh, spoke of the medical establishment closing ranks and conflicts of interest, and we hope to get to the bottom of that through Professor Britton's review of the review. And Miles Briggs highlighted the disregard of directives by some Scottish health boards and the current situation regarding NICE guidance. So while there's been a focus throughout on the issue in the Scottish context, context, there's little doubt that the issues we've been considering extend far beyond our own borders. Indeed, it's been referred to as a global scandal. There was a sense back in 2014 when the then Cabinet Secretary Alec Neil announced, uh, as I said, the independent review and moratorium, that Scotland was actually taking the lead on what was considered to be a matter of signific significance around the world. And as work has con in Scotland has continued, there have been developments in other countries, and it may now be the case that some other countries are seen as leading the way, which is unfortunate given where we were. Uh, I'll leave the judgment of who is leading the way to others, but would comment on, on some recent developments in other jurisdictions, which, may, which have already been mentioned uh, this afternoon. Last week it was reported that later this month the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence will issue updated guidance on the use of MESH, on that point, it's worth noting that the Office of the Chief Medical Officer has previously advised NHS boards and directors that, and I quote, the inv investigation and treatment of all patients should follow NICE guidelines, which, whilst not mandatory in Scotland, are recommended as good practice, end quote. I hope the Cabinet Secretary will provide an update to the committee in terms of best practice across Scotland in the event that NICE does update its guidelines. Now, as recently as the 28th of November, the Therapeutic Goods Administration in Australia, the equivalent of the UK's MHRA, announced that with effect from the 4th of January 2018, and I quote, transvaginal mesh products whose sole use is the treatment of pelvic organ prolapse via transvaginal implantation, end quote, will be removed from the Australian Register of Therapeutic Goods. That decision was based on the TGA's belief, and I quote again, that the benefits of using transvaginal mesh products in the treatment of pelvic organ prolapse do not outweigh the risks these products, products pose to patients. It adds that the TGA also considers that there's a lack of scientific evidence before the TGA for it to be satisfied that the risks to patients associated with the use of mesh products as single incision uh, mini slings for the treatment of stress urina urinary incontinence are outweighed by their benefits. Uh, and I believe it's the case, thanks to information received from the petitioners, that it's also the situation in New Zealand. Uh, for the Public Petitions Committee, the recent developments both here and abroad will be something to reflect on as we consider our draft report. Uh, in time, I think it's more likely that we will also consider the findings of Professor Alison Britton's review of the review. And I hope it will be a robust review which should report on the process and flaws of the first review so that lessons are learned for the future, including ensuring that patient representatives feel that they can fully participate, which sadly wasn't the case in the first review. Uh, Professor Britton's review will consider the, the process of the independent review uh, and will make recommendations around the conduct of similar reviews in the future. However, the professor will not re-examine uh, the evidence considered by the initial independent review, and our conclusions will therefore have no bearing on the moratorium that was ordered in 2014 and continues to this day. Now, I understand that uh, Professor Britton will soon begin undertaking consultation on her work, and I hope that individuals who have been impacted by MESH feel able to respond to that consultation. In fact, I would encourage them to do so. 
Uh, in the meantime, the uh, Public Petitions Committee would continue to welcome any contributions from members of the public who want to ensure that this Parliament hears their voice. And I'm sure I speak for all the committee members, if not the whole chamber, uh, when I say I look forward to working on the draft report to ensure the petitioners and campaigners who have ensured this dreadful set of circumstances is on the radar are given their voice and listened to. To, to paraphrase the convener's remarks in her opening speech, this petition is far from closed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms MacDonald. And that concludes the debate on petition P1517 on polypropylene mesh medical devices. It's time to move on to the next item of business and I'll suspend briefly to allow you to take your seats for the next item, which is the emergency question.